Can you imagine the mental torment of losing a child who went missing or had been kidnapped? And before the heartache was over, you had to deal with impersonation, police coercion, false imprisonment, psychiatric mistreatment, possible murder, and a very long, arduous court battle. While at the same time, the case became public knowledge, spreading throughout the country, making national news, leaving the nation holding its breath. Well, that's what Christine Collins had to face back in 1928, when her nine-year-old son Walter disappeared. Hi there, my friend. I'm Royston, and welcome back to the channel. Christine, the mother of the missing boy, was understandably perplexed as she experienced dramatic heartbreak, not just to be reunited with him, but also in dealing with the authority. The police were eventually able to find who they believed was her son, and when she met this young boy, she was shocked to the core. We'll soon find out why, as TN Crime collaborates with the crime reel to investigate. One day in March 1928, when the sun was shining brightly, as it was a lovely day, and children were out playing, having a good time, nine-year-old Walter Collins was keen to go to the cinema, inquiring of his mother if that was possible. She was happy for him to do that, giving him money for admission, as it was only down the street from their home in Los Angeles. Christine worked as a telephone operative whilst her husband was in prison making her a single mother, doing her best to raise the nine-year-old. However, that was the last time she'd ever see her son, as he failed to return. Christine became worried enough to visit neighbours one by one, especially those with children who were friends of Walter, but no one had seen him. The anxious mother spent hours standing at her doorstep, looking up and down the street, hoping to see her only child walking back but sadly, he never did. As it got darker, her fear grew enormously, leading her to contact the police, reporting him as missing. Los Angeles had been traumatized just three months prior to this, when 12-year-old Marion Parker was kidnapped for ransom by a psychopath named William Hickman, who brutally murdered and dismembered her. Although he was in custody when Walter vanished, the fear left behind in Los Angeles was significantly high. On top of that, another individual who lived 50 miles away from where Walter disappeared was going around hunting and murdering children with the help of his mother and nephew. Initially, during five agonizing months, the Los Angeles Police Department paid great attention to Walter's case. Countless tips on his whereabouts were followed up and he was allegedly spotted hundreds of miles away in San Francisco. Eventually, a witness came forward claiming to have seen the boy in the back seat of a car at a Glendale gas station. This was only 10 miles from his home. The witness, who was the owner of the gas station, went on to explain that the driver was foreign-looking, possibly an Italian man, accompanied by a woman. In addition to this, the boy's father, Walter Collins Sr., was in prison serving time for robbery, yet he believed that former inmates looking for revenge against him kidnapped his son. That theory was based on the amount of people that he had robbed over the years, taking money and valuables from them. He committed armed robbery on at least one occasion. This made him believe that someone wanted revenge. All of these allegations the sightings and stuff to do with inmates were investigated. However, they couldn't be corroborated and led to nothing. The Los Angeles police were under increasing pressure to solve the case. The public were on fire and demanded a resolution, even criticizing the authorities for not resolving it already. All of that changed in August 1928 five months after the disappearance, when a mysterious child appeared who fit Walter's description in DeKalb, Illinois, which was 2,000 miles away, who was claiming to be Walter. When Christine received news that her son had been found, she was elated. 
It seemed like all the anguish and disappointment experienced over the last few months was coming to a conclusion. Little did she realise a new twist in the case was about to develop. Firstly, the authorities made Christine pay for the boys' train fare of $70 after police questioned him in Illinois, which, for a single mother, was a colossal amount, equivalent to $1,100 in today's value. The only thing on this loving mother's mind was being reunited with her son. She would have done anything to get him back. On the day of the reunion and the search for Walter now officially called off, Christine was eagerly waiting for the train carrying her son to arrive. We can only imagine what might have gone through her mind after all the suffering that she was subjected to since March of that year, when finally making eye contact with her lost child only to realise that it wasn't him. The first words she uttered when seeing him were, quote, I do not think that is my boy. End quote. Christine immediately informed the officer in charge, Captain J.J. Jones, who was at the station with her, that they had the wrong boy. Yet Jones felt he'd just solved the case that was deemed the highlight of his career, an achievement that he was proud of. Christine, on the other hand, adamantly explained that this boy belonged to someone else, yet astonishingly was told in no uncertain terms that she was wrong and it was her son. Despite her continued protests that they were wrong, not her, combined with the authorities who'd been under immense pressure to close this case, it's almost unbelievable how they treated this vulnerable woman. What mother doesn't know what her own child looks like? What major developmental changes takes place in a child over a five-month period? Christine knew her son, and she also understood that the boy found in Illinois wasn't him. But the authorities weren't listening as they wanted public pressure off their back as well as the criticising to stop. The police maintained pressure on Christine who was under enough duress. Captain JJ Jones went on to use four words that were absolutely shocking when he insisted that she should try the boy out. The distressed woman was instructed to try the boy out by taking him home. By now she was exhausted and forced to reluctantly agree to this. However, over the next three weeks, Christine collected substantial evidence to prove what she'd been saying all along. Not only evidence from friends who could back her up, but Walter's dentist provided dental records showing several fillings belonging to him, yet the youngster she was trying out not only didn't have those fillings, but there was no proof that he'd ever had any dental work done at all. This hard evidence was taken to the police station to confront Captain Jones in an attempt to make him understand once and for all that he made a massive mistake, coercing her to take someone home who was impersonating her son, while at the same time encouraging the media to take a photo of the reunion to make themselves as a police force look good in finally resolving a difficult case. When the evidence was presented to Captain Jones showing a serious error had without question occurred, instead of being empathic toward the poor woman and realising that three weeks had passed since they stopped looking for the real Walter, what he did next was unforgivable. He actually made the situation a hundred times worse because of his incompetence. The last thing he wanted to do was make a public apology, confirming to the whole nation that he was wrong from day one. So instead, he dramatically misused his power by bad-mouthing the grieving mother, calling her all kinds of belittling names, even stating to her that she was the most cruel-hearted woman that he'd ever met, as well as an unfit mother. Jones then went on to have her sectioned under Code 12, which was used on people considered an inconvenience. Christine was sent to a psychiatric ward in Los Angeles where she remained for 10 days. Using that Code 12 was a terrible practice the police frequently employed at the time. However, the information Jones received must have played on his mind. Because while Christine was in the asylum, he decided to interview the boy found in Illinois to prove himself right. But it didn't work out as planned. Under interrogation, the boy caved in and finally admitted he was an imposter. 
His real name was Arthur Hutchins Jr., a 12-year-old from Iowa. Hutchins had run away from home due to his strained relationship with his stepmother who he despised. Plus he had issues with the police over there, as he was often involved in petty crime. He explained when he was picked up in Illinois that the police asked if his name was Walter Collins as that case was all over the news. It was pointed out to him that he closely resembled the missing youngster. Once he realised he was a lookalike and that the missing boy was from Los Angeles, he devised a plan to escape from his stepmother, telling the police, yes, he was Walter Collins. He also had another motive, as he wanted to meet his idol, an actor named Tom Mix. The confession put Captain Jones in a situation he was dreading. He had to admit he returned the wrong boy, which Christine was repeatedly telling him. The failure of the LAPD was now out in the open, but Christine was still in the asylum, remaining there for a few more days before being discharged, after which she filed a lawsuit against the LAPD, and guess what? She won. Yes. And Captain Jones, who was an ignorant man, was ordered to compensate Christine to the value of almost $11,000. Unfortunately, over the next 10 years and despite the order, plus several attempts by Christine to collect the money, as she planned to use it to fund her search, Jones never paid a penny. Atrociously, the Los Angeles Police Department suspended Jones for merely a few months. But as soon as things died down, he was permanently reinstated. The corruption back then in the Los Angeles Police Force was unthinkable. While that corrupt system was still in place, Christine continued searching, believing he could still be alive and a lead soon transpired in late 1928. Now, earlier in the video, the crime reel mentioned that 50 miles from Walter's home, someone was hunting young boys to murder with help from his mother and nephew. Well, six months after Walter vanished, a mother and son were arrested in Canada, where they fled to. They were apprehended in September 1928, when a man named Gordon Northcott would soon be dubbed the Wineville Chicken Coop murderer by the press. Between 1926 to 28. Gordon would drive around looking for young boys in California to abduct, brutally molest and kill. He actually took his 13-year-old nephew with him to make it easier to lure the boys into his vehicle. His mother, Sarah Northcott, was an accomplice. And while in police custody, she confessed to having participated in several murders, including that of nine-year-old Walter Collins. For some reason, though, she would often retract her confessions. Her son did the same. On one hand, he'd mention he killed a number of boys, then he'd withdraw his statement. However, evidence was found on the farm, where Gordon would lead the youngsters to the incubator room to watch the little chickens. His real motive was to kill the unsuspecting boys with an axe, before destroying the evidence covering the bodies in quicklime. Sanford Clark, his nephew, who was used to help abduct the boys, was 15 in 1928 and informed the authorities that graves could be found near the chicken coop. He indicated Walter was among the victims, pointing out where the nine-year-old was killed. Three shallow graves were found, but the full bodies were unavailable, only pieces of bone existed. They also found axes on the farm with human hair and blood on them. Enough evidence was produced to convict Gordon and his mother. Louise pled guilty to Walter's murder and was sentenced to life in prison. The only reason Gordon wasn't held responsible was because of his mother's confession. Unfortunately, she was released after serving just 12 years. Gordon was convicted for murdering three boys, none of them being Walter, and sentenced to death. Despite his fate, he wanted the world to know he had nothing to do with Walter's situation, even though his mother admitted she helped him murder numerous boys. Christine, who never stopped looking for her son, made a visit to Gordon in prison because she was eager to find out the truth while needing some form of closure, asking him outright if he killed Walter. Gordon denied it, but found a little bit of enjoyment playing with her mind. The conclusion was that he was insane, as he didn't seem to know what he believed. Somehow, her opinion provided hope. A hope 
ignited by a severe lack of any real physical evidence. His remains were never found at the chicken farm, plus the Northcott's ambiguous claims of Walter's fate actually strengthened Christine's hope. Then just before his execution, he sent Christine a telegram explaining that he lied when denying Walter was among his victims. This time he promised to be truthful about her plight if Christine paid him another visit. Now at last she had an opportunity for closure. Therefore she travelled the 400 miles to San Quentin to visit, but on arrival was met by Gordon, who unreasonably changed his mind about providing any details. Instead, he continued being ambiguous, saying he didn't know anything about his son while proclaiming his innocence. Christine was distraught by his conduct and understandably so, yet also comforted by it. Again, her hope was still intact that Walter could be alive. If Gordon had anything he could have explained to Christine, he chose not to. However, his state-sanctioned punishment was carried out in October 1930 when he was hung to death. Five years later, a boy approached the police with his parents who was once suspected as being a victim of the Northcotts when he went missing years earlier. Yet suddenly, here he was alive and well. But it wasn't Walter. Nonetheless, it was another occurrence that Christine took as a positive sign. She spent the rest of her life actively searching for her son until sadly passing away in 1964 at the age of 75. I can't even begin to imagine the mental torture she endured over all of those years, you know, when dealing with impersonation, police harassment, psychiatric abuse, and a long-winded court battle in a quest to simply be reunited with her son. And just in case you're unaware, the 2008 movie Changeling, starring Angelina Jolie, is based on the Collins story, while highlighting the corruption within the Los Angeles Police Department at that time. But at this time, I'd like to thank the Crime Reel for taking part in this collaboration. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description box for you guys to go and check out, which I'm sure you will. But the question I want to leave with you is how do you feel about the way Christine was treated by the police? And also, do you believe Gordon Northcott had anything to do with this case? Well, let us know in the comment section down below. And regarding the police, why not take a look at a brutal practice they used in Canada from a video about to appear on the screen if it's not already appearing. Well, I'm Royston and thanks for watching. Oh, and by the way, the Crime Reel has some final words to say to you. Just like to say thanks very much to T and Crime for asking me if I would like to collaborate on this video. Thanks for the opportunity. For anyone interested in my channel, I am also a true crime narrator and you're welcome to visit my channel at any time. Come visit the Crime Reel. Goodbye.